you know, for a long time I've been putting off talking about this because a lot of people in my personal life was telling me since I'm making videos right now, I should take the time to share with whoever's observing this video what I shared with them because they feel that it's um, very important in terms of my um, motorcycle accident. So I'm going to go through this very slow because this is a very um, delicate subject. But you know, as I said before, my motorcycle accident, it transpired in 2014. It was February the 10th. This wasn't too long after my, um, my dad had came out here to um, somewhat visit me. And um, 2014 was a very um, difficult year. And I was suffering a whole lot with exhaustion. In my previous video, I had mentioned of how exhaustion doesn't give you a warning. You know, as I said before, when you're tired, the organism sends a message to your mind. It tells you, I'm tired. You need to get some rest. You know, it even sends you other signals like yarning, and short memory, and other things as that. Then you have all of these external forces that are going on outside of you that's preventing you from being able to get proper rest by way of the whole stress element and the disappointments that are going on in your life that's causing this stress thing to transpire to the degree that you're unable to sleep. So in 2014, I was working at a place called the Rio Casino. And I worked at the Rio Casino for like seven and a half years. I worked back in the kitchen area, which is the stewarding department, the department that works at night and we went around and we cleaned all of the restaurants in the um, casino. Now, I was the only black man in the entire department. Morning shift, swing shift, and gray. I was the only black man in the entire department. And I was working the graveyard shift because I enjoy working at night. And so by me being the only black man in that department, I was surrounded by a whole lot of Hispanics who didn't want me there. And so they would go out of their way to try to get me eliminated from working there, sabotaging my, my work and everything. So it took me a while to win these men over. And, um, I was under consistent stress every time I turned around. If my coworkers were not trying to set me up to be terminated, it was the management trying to place me with workers. And these workers would be very aggressive and rude towards me, trying to provoke me into um, different forms of violence, whether it's physical or verbal. And um, so I was dealing with that every night. I was dealing with that every night. Now, along with that, I mentioned that my father had came out here. And so I had not seen this man in 32 years. 
because of his disrespect towards me. And I'm the type of man where I don't care who you are. If you don't have any respect towards me, I'm not going to deal with you. I don't, I don't care who you are, mother, father, Jesus, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So it's all about self-preservation and self-protection. Because see, I look at people, I look at certain human beings as fire. And once you get to know fire, you know, fire is a very beautiful substance that the creator has produced. It's very beautiful and it's very alive. And the reason why it's moving is because it's a living thing. It's very beautiful. And it's sacred, so you can't touch it. But you don't know that until you've gotten too close to it. I've always thought that fire was beautiful. And so one day when I got a little too close to fire, tried to touch it, it burnt my hand. So instantly, I learned that if you get too close to fire, it's gonna harm you. And as time went on, I found out that a lot of human beings have that living principle sitting up inside of them. And so I came to know through my family, through my friends, and pretty much everyone in whom I've come in contact with outside of my two sons, that if you get too close to human beings, you're gonna get burned. So I used to always say human beings are like fire. If you get too close, you're gonna get burned. So when my father came out here, I don't necessarily have to go through that whole experience. He said some very offensive things to me, even after 32 years. He said some very offensive things about my sons. He was calling them bastards because me and their mother wasn't uh, married when we had them. I mean, it was just a big mess. It was a big mess. So I was carrying that. I was in a um, very abusive relationship with this woman named Sandra Levi, who was an alcoholic. I was having a, um, I guess, what you call a relationship with her off and on for the past 11 years. I was dealing with her, her alcoholism. And because of her alcoholism, she every time I turned around, she was sleeping around with different people while I was at work, working to take care of both of us. She was somewhere laid up with some dude. And she would make certain that before I got in, she had got in. So that was going on. And so with all of this, me still trying to do the right thing, I became exhausted because you're carrying all of those burdens. And so, an opportunity came for me at a hotel out here that used to be titled the Hilton Hotel, where um, brother Elvis Presley used to, he, he used to perform there a whole lot, along with the Rat Pack, you know, if you're familiar with these men. And so, even though near the, um, my ending times at the Rio ended up being very pleasant, even though I would have some discompatibilities with some workers who was dedicated to being prejudiced because I was a black man and they were Mexican, you know, that, that never goes away. 
thanks to um, culture and tradition, which a whole lot of people on this planet mistakenly think is something that helps the human family. But um, so I had a um, an interview, a final interview at the Hilton one morning. So I get up, I believe it was at 10 a.m. I get on my motorcycle and I drew, um, I rode from where me and Sandra were staying. And the quickest way to the Rio to pick up my final check was the street called the Desert Inn. And on Desert Inn, it had a, a bridge that had like an underpass that you go over it and you come up and you go towards the street called Paradise. So as I'm riding down Desert Inn, I go under the underpass. And as I was coming up from the underpass, all of a sudden, there's this dark tunnel that started closing in on me. And I'm like, what is going on? And all of a sudden, my body, it shut off. And when my body shut off, my right hand was on my accelerator. And I guess my body went into a shock. And so my body did like that and it sped up the motorcycle. And so I went towards paradise and it was already a red light. But I'm I'm unconscious on my bike. So I go through the red light at 57 miles an hour. And there's there was a I didn't see this because I was out, but I heard everything. There was a a white RV who went past the green light because my light was red. He went past the green light and all of a sudden I crashed into the front section of his um, RV. I heard um, my skull fracture here because I sustained a orbital fracture. And I heard a lot of banging, which was my organism banging against the, um, the ground. And when I hit the ground, my eyes came open and I saw this white truck coming towards me. And as this white truck was coming towards me, I just faded. I died. But you know, in the midst of all of the banging that I heard, I was saying in my mind, Lord, not now, not now, not right now, but it was so. So after everything, I faded away and suddenly I was in a state that I explained before was the area within the living universe that I formerly exist in within the spirit before the creator spoke my essence into the womb of my mother of when the word became flesh. But what was so profound about it is that I was in the midst of light and darkness. I was outside the organism 
and therefore there was no information I can't say no information in my mind because I was outside the organism I was back into being a spiritual essence there was no memory there was no knowledge in terms of my name is David I just had an accident I have two sons all of that was gone it was left inside of the organism because this organism is like a sponge and when we go around and we experience the living condition we accumulate experiences and experiences are knowledge information emotions love joy hate all of all of those living principles that we accumulate along our living experience but when you're outside of the organism all of those living experience all of the things that you 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 accumulated it dies with the organism because it's the organism is what accumulated that information you don't take that with you you know you hear a lot of people say i'm going to see my mother i'm going to see my grandmother um when i died i saw jesus opening up his arms to me and said come my child you didn't see any of that and if you saw any of that you wasn't dead what you saw was your religious programming going in harmony with your imagination your imagination going in harmony with your wants and desires that's all that was but you were not deceased at that moment but all information is left behind in the organism all of the emotions that are cultivated from that information is left behind in the organism all of that dies with the flesh it all dies with the flesh so the state that i was in the best way that i can explain it is that i was very much alive i was in a state of where we think we know what freedom is but being encased in this this organism you would never know what real freedom is because due to the fact that we are spiritual beings and we have been encased inside of this flesh we will never know what freedom is ever And especially if we're living, living in the state of a worldly type living, you know, like Jesus said, you must be born again into the spirit. And if you meet a lot of spiritual people who have almost gotten there, you will find that very, very little things trouble them they're free they're free-minded their their mind is free their thoughts is free they they um they respond they respond differently to experiences in life but the state that i was in there was no knowledge no memory know anything but I was in a state of pure clarity I was in the state of the no and when I say that I was in a the pure state of awareness that does not imply that I had this profound constitution of knowledge it wasn't knowledge it was just pure awareness without it being a constitution 
in which explain what awareness is. You were just, I was just present. You know how the, the creator said, I am that I am. I am present. I was present. I existed. I was in that state of existence to where all was known, but it all was known beyond mere knowledge. There was, I was not in a state of a containment, a containment. I wasn't inside of something. And therefore there was no, what you people call vibration, no. Vibration implies being inside something. And there is a circumference around you that is vibrating and therefore preventing, preventing you to honestly express yourself of what you are. I wasn't inside anything. I was everything. I was a part back to being a part of everything that bears life and power. And when I say power, I don't imply a degree of power. The best way that that's the only way that I can explain the vibrance of being completely alive without having a limitation of time in order to exist. There was no limitation. I existed. It's not that I was in the universe, I was the universe. Everything that was about me was me. Everything. I mean, this this is the, the best way that I can explain it. And the feeling that it gave me, proceed. The only thing that I could say is that I've never felt so free in all of my existence. And there was a very familiar feeling and that familiarity, if I said that word right, told me that present moment that this is what I was and this is where I was before I was spoken into the womb of my earthly mother. And coming to realize that I was at peace. I was comfortable. I was myself, even without given an earthly name as David. I still wasn't David. I just simply exist. I was the universe. I was everything. I was movement. I was everything that had movement outside of being created by the one and only God. And that's what we are. We are extensions of our creator. And we are given a time to exist in this living universe and everything is destined for a certain time for us to be spoken into the womb of our mothers that we may fulfill our purpose in the physical on this planet. I have went back to that. And I say back to it because as I said before, it felt very, very familiar and therefore it felt right. I was who I was without a name, without any knowledge. I was a part of the great I am, I exist. That's, that's, that's the best way 
then I can explain it. You're not limited as the flesh. What did you see, David? You see everything. You're not limited to these eyes that are limited. You can only see so much with the organism. But when you're in the spirit, everything is seen, everything is felt. There's light and there's darkness and they work in harmony. And the only way that you are able to see the darkness is because of the light. And the only way that you are able to see the light is because of darkness. It all goes in harmony. They all go in harmony. But then when you get down here on this earth, we're educated to think that light and darkness oppose one another. They're enemies. When every day of our lives, if we really open our eyes, the reason why you have day and the reason why you have light, um, night, the reason why you have, you turn on the light and the darkness leaves is because they both are in cooperation with one another. They do not oppose one another. They were both created for a reason. When everything is given a characteristic, darkness is evil, light is good. Now the earthly realm says this about these two. However, darkness wouldn't have an identity if it wasn't for light and vice versa. They work in harmony. They both were created by the same creator. Now, when my organism started regenerating, obviously, I felt the creator bringing me back to the organism, which is destiny. That movement is destiny because I recognized it as destiny because I was being pulled out of that state and returned to the organism. And the reason why suddenly I knew this in terms of knowledge is because of that one little movement of going back. Immediately, perception came. And when perception came, suddenly knowledge memory all of that stuff all of those things kicked in and i immediately told the creator no i do not want to go back there please leave me here please leave me here and the powerful thing about destiny is the fact that even though i did not want to come back when I rejected coming back to this planet, I didn't feel any tugging. No, I don't want to go back because you're, you, you can't have that because you're outside of the flesh. You're in the spirit. And due to the fact that you can't tug, all you can say is, no, I don't want to go back. The power behind that it's that you can't fight it. You can't fight destiny. You're just going back. And so what I noticed is that when my memory started coming back, my name is David. I felt a weight on me. I'm like, oh, I'm back to this. And then when my memory came back because the organism was functioning and started to wake up. When the knowledge that I had, two sons, 
came to me, there was love and there was fear and therefore a burden. Now people may say, why is that so? It's because our children are our greatest love and therefore our children is our greatest fear. We love them tremendously with all of our hearts. And our biggest fear is to lose them. And so we're dealing with the dual component, gaining, losing. And so I didn't want to have to deal with that again, because now this knowledge has returned of me having two sons. And so now you have to go back on the earth and you are going to have to deal with that fear and that love. You're going to have to find some way to deal with it and find an area of peace in dealing with that. So we're dealing with attachments. Now, a lot of people may say, well, those are your sons. How can you say that they are attachments? Because in reality, our children are an extension of us and we love our children. And we don't want to lose our children. And that's where the attachment comes. I mean, let's just be real. And so we go back to where the accident happened. I started coming to, and I felt the paramedics put me into the back of the ambulance had the cover over my face and everything because they said that I had died. And so when I started moving, I jerked up and they said, hold on, hold on, hold on. He's still with us. And so the first thing that I started to do was move my fingers like this. And one of the paramedics had said, be still, you have some broken bones. And so I kept moving my fingers. And he said, why are you moving your fingers? He said, you are not paralyzed. Why are you moving your fingers? I said, because I'm a writer. Those were my first, wor my, my first words coming back. I am a writer. So talk about the creator. When he created me, he spoke that destiny into me you are a writer this i'm going to make david a writer so on this second opportunity of life the first words that came out of my mouth was because i'm a writer and i told this paramedic i said i have to be certain that i am able to write i said if I am not able to write. I said, put me back in the street and leave me there. And he said, you're not paralyzed. But we need you to be still because you've broken some bones. This hand, as I said before, was turned completely all the way around. And so they said that they had to turn my hand all the way back around and they, they had to put a brace on it. They had to sew this brow up because when I hit the truck, my brow had torn and all of this, I think they said it was some type of blood vessel in my brow had was shattered. And so they had to hurry up and stitch me up before I bled to death because I bled all over the street. And so that's why 
when I got there, I mean, when, when the paramedics showed up, according to them, I didn't have any life signs. And I believed them considering where I was, where my spirit was. And so, even though I was still bleeding, it, I, it, it looked so bad, they said, we're, we're not getting any life signs. So they started sewing me up because this whole area was flat back. And um, they turned my hand back around and everything. And so they took me two blocks from there up to this hospital called Sunrise, Sunrise Hospital. And I kept saying my name, my social security number over and over again. I was repeating both of my son's social security number, their mother's social security number. I was talking and the paramedics like, why, why, why are you doing this? I said, I have to make certain that my mind is operating. Now, I understood my memory was able to remember all of that. However, there were some areas of this experience that I didn't remember at all. Like the x-ray pictures that I had before this video, I don't remember taking those at all. As a matter of fact, I didn't even remember where my accident transpired until a month and a half. Where the guy, um, his name is Vincent. His insurance company called me. And they said that, um, wasn't you in an accident? I'm like, yes. She said, well, do you remember where you had it? I'm like, no, I, I still don't remember. She said, you. You don't remember who you hit? And I said, I hit someone? And she says, yes. And she said, yeah, his name is Vincent and everything. And I'm like, do you have his number? And she said, yes, I'll give you his number after we um, talk. And so after her and I talked, I called up Vincent. This very nice European guy. And he said, Bro, I'm so happy you made it. He said, because you know, you were stretched out like you were on the cross and you were gone, bro. You, you, you were, you were, it was so much blood. He said, everybody who stopped and looked at you, they said, he's gone, he's gone. And so I apologized to him and I told him that, um, I was having some problems with exhaustion. You know, I just explained the whole thing to him and I offered to um, pay for the accident. You know, the damage that I did to his RV, he said I put a big crack in his front fender of his RV. And he said, bro, don't worry about it. He said, my insurance company is gonna take care of that. But I told him, I said, please let me do something. He said, it's all taken care of, bro. He said, I'm just happy that you're still with us. And a couple of days later, Vincent came to visit me. And I didn't even know he was going to come by. I lived upstairs. Vincent called me. He said, hey, Dave, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. He said, I need you to look outside your door. And I looked outside my door and there he was. He was down there in the parking lot. And I went downstairs and this huge <laughs> five foot two white guy looks like he's um, he was almost like 270 pounds. 
and we embraced each other. And the way that he embraced me, he said, bro, I'm, I'm just so happy that you're still here. Now, this is a white man telling a black man, you see where I'm thinking is? That he's happy that he is still on the planet. And we both cried, you know? And um, I asked him, I said, did you take any pictures? You know, I told him I, I would like to see the pictures. He said, bro, you don't need that. You don't need to see yourself like that. He said, I took some pictures. He said, but I deleted them because I knew you were going to ask me that. And so we went to have breakfast and we promised to stay in touch and everything. And I think that I spoke with Vincent just one time since that. But um, afterward, I had spent, I'm moving too fast anyway, but I met Vincent after I got out of physical rehab. I just needed to talk about that. And so when I was in the hospital, I was in Sunrise Hospital for a whole week. The day that I had the accident, the hospital called Sandra. She came up to the hospital. She saw that I was all bandaged up and she was shocked and everything. So she asked me what happened and I told her. And so she stayed at the hospital with me for one night. And I remember me all of a sudden just started talking because I knew she was there. And she, I said, Sandra, and she said, I'm still here. I said, you know, I died. And she said, what do you mean? I said, I died. I, I died for a few minutes. I said, and I said, it was the most beautiful experience that I've ever had in my life. It was the most beautiful experience. And uh, I wasn't able to explain it because of my head injury. So I wasn't able to articulate it. And she said, just get some rest, babe. Just, just, just get some rest. And so the following morning, We wake up, the doctors came in there and they was checking me and they had to call my joint specialist. He said, you still riding that motorcycle? I like, not no more. I told my joint, uh, my um, joint specialist who um, looked after me, my first two accidents, because this accident was my, my third one. He said, so you still riding that thing, huh? I'm like, not no more. I said, I'm done, bro. They called a specialist. And he came in and he checked on me. And I remember him being in the hallway, talking to some other doctors. And he was looking back at me. He was shaking his head like this. And so my primary doctor, whose name I don't remember, who was looking after me at Sunrise Hospital. He came in and I asked him, what was he, why was he looking back at me like that? He said, we're trying to figure out how you survived. He said, because considering your, your injuries, according to, um, your x-rays, you're not supposed to be here. And he said, we don't understand how you survived it. But after 
them giving me blood tests, urine tests, and all of that, they came to understand that this man has never abused his organism. He never smoked, he never drank, he never did drugs. He had, hasn't done anything to his organism. And so one of the reasons why I survived that accident was because of the condition of my organism. I always kept it in shape and I've always kept, kept it health, um, healthy. And so after they left, Sandra started complaining about how uncomfortable she was sleeping in the hospital chair the first night. So I told Sandra, Sandra, I just had the worst accident of my life. You know, I died last night and you hear complaining about a you being uncomfortable in a hospital chair. I said, the only thing you have to do is go home. We live two blocks down the street. Just get you some rest and come back. And she went on, well, you know, I was very uncomfortable. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh, okay. Now what she's trying to do is to justify going over to her dad's house where she used to go all the time to meet up with all of her boyfriends. So I said, you know what, Sandra? Just leave. Just leave. Just leave me be. I said, because the only thing you have to do is just go home and get some rest and just come back and spend some time with me. That's all you have to do. I said, just leave. Go on over to your dad's house because that's that's all that's all you're gonna do. She said, I'm not gonna go over there, blah blah blah. So when she left, according to our landlord, she went home. She packed all of her things, and as she was leaving, my manager said. What happened to David? Where's David? She said Sandra told her he had a, another accident and he's up there at Sunrise Hospital. And so the manager asked her, where are you going? And she didn't say nothing, she just left. Come to find out, she didn't go over to her father's house. She went over to one of her other boyfriend's house named Mark and she laid up with him while I'm laid up in the hospital fighting for my life. My cell phone had got lost in the accident and you know what they do now. We are put in the position to where we no longer memorize phone numbers. So I wasn't able to call my son, I wasn't able to call their mother, I wasn't able to call anyone for a whole week to um, in the um, Sunrise Hospital to let them know exactly what happened to me. And so after that, it was one night in Sunrise, I just woke up at 2.30 a.m. I got out of my bed and I started walking around, you know, where they have all of the rooms. I was just out walking. And I'll never forget this, this young man. He looked like he was about 20, between 23 and 26 years old. Young black guy came up to me. He said, Mr. Brayboy, what are you doing out of your bed? He said, man, you just had an accident two days ago. What are you doing out of your bed? And suddenly my mind just, because of my head injury, I couldn't tell him why. I just needed to walk. He said, come on. You know, he, he grabbed me by my arm. He said, come on, man, you can't, you can't be like this. You have to lay down. 
He said, you need rest. And so I cooperated with him. And um, because my injuries were tremendous. You know, this whole, the whole side of my face, my eye was shut and I could barely see out of my right eye, you know? And um, my arms, this arm was swollen. I guess you could see it in the um, X-ray. I called it Popeye arms. I had big, big Popeye arms. And um, so I was in Sunrise Hospital for one week. And um, after that week, they transferred me to a physical therapy building off a street out here called Charleston and Valley View. And I was there for one week until my insurance had ran out. And so they had to send me home because um, my whole accident itself cost $81,000. And my culinary insurance covered um, most of that, except for eleven thousand dollars. And so, because of the um, all of the treatments and the physical therapy and all of that, they had to um, exit me from physical therapy. But while I was there. The people at Sunrise Hospital were able to get in touch with my son's mother. And I believe it was three days before I left, my um, son's mother had brought both of my sons up there to see me along with her sister. And um, that was a beautiful experience. And, you know, my sons were looking at me because I was still in terrible shape. And, you know, my oldest son wanted me to buy him a motorcycle. And I really didn't want to buy him. And so when he was looking down at me, I looked up at him. I said, you see this? I said, this is why I didn't want to buy you a motorcycle. I didn't want my sons to suffer what I went through. So after physical therapy, I got out and I went home. And the after effects of experiencing something like that in the spiritual realm, having to come back to a place that you would, you, you really didn't want to come back here, regardless of having children or, or anything like that. You were such at a you were at such a state to where anything and everything that you accomplished down here on this planet it didn't mean anything to you, and it it couldn't mean anything to you because all of that information was gone. But even when you were on your way back here, you were in such a state to where regardless of having children and everything that was going on with your life. You didn't want to come back here because you were at such a state of peace and bliss and of the no, and you were, you were, you might as well say flushed of all of the knowledge and all of the experiences and therefore all of the stress all of the hard times, all of the humiliation, all of the betrayal, it was all gone. And you were in the state of where you were free. No more hurt, no more struggles and the, the after effects. All of those things were gone. And then when you have to come back here, here it is. You're back in this earthly plane and you're back to all of the love, all of the hate, all of the betrayal, all of the the pain, all of these things 
are still present because of destiny. The creator said, I'm not done with you and you're not done with you. You were put through that so that you can learn of me, of you, and of yourself. So after experiencing that, you go through a period of anger. And I went through some anger issues for a long time because after you experience being in that state and then you're brought back to this, I dealt with a lot of anger issues and it changed my personality for a long time because you're here and you and you don't want to be here and so it's easy to become non-productive because you don't want to be here but you have to get back to being productive in order for you to be able to function and therefore survive being here But all at the same time, you're grateful for being back because you have two sons. And so it's profound, it's profound. And so you're back to this dual existence. And after that, I was working at this place called Luxor. And I was dealing with a whole lot of harassment from the supervisor who didn't care about my accident, you know, because I would forget things quick. I, you know, it had gotten to the point to where I had to start writing things down. You know, they would ask me to do something and then I walk away and three minutes later, I forgot what they told me. So I would have to find them again and like, what was it that you told me that you needed me to do? And this guy's name was Gabe, and he would get frustrated like, Dave, I told you. Blah, blah. And so one, one day him and I sat down and we had a talk. And I told him what happened to me and one of the reasons why I forget things so easily is because I had a tremendous head injury, you know? And so even though he told me, here's, here's a pad and a pen. He said, so whatever I ask you to do, just, just write it down. Just write it down. However, even though he told me to write everything down, he knew, and he was a, another Hispanic guy, he knew because of my head injury, even though he told me to write everything down, he still started, he started harassing me a whole lot. And so I'm going to go into that because that's, that's, that's not important. But I survived that and I ended up um, leaving the Luxor and I started working at the wind out here. And during my time at the wind, my head injury had healed. My memory came back and everything. And so here I am. But I've always wanted to talk about my accident because I thought that maybe it would be helpful for someone, but just know that when you are outside of this flesh and the creator gives you the opportunity to read and to understand why you're outside of this flesh and you're privileged to be contained with a memory of what you experience once you're back in the flesh. It takes a lot of intelligence and wisdom in order for you to accumulate that level of information. And you're not going to be able to express it wholeheartedly because the organism can only contain so much wisdom and knowledge in order to be able to express it on a certain level, but not in its completeness because we're limited in this, in this flesh. But all I can say about that experience is that the only 
fear that I have now is losing my two sons because of the tremendous love that I have for them. And so I no longer have a fear factor because I know that death is not something to be feared. Death is not something to be um, excited to embrace. So don't don't get the wrong impression. I'm, I'm not promoting death. I'm just saying that death should not be feared. It shouldn't be feared. Because when you're outside this organism, it's it's a beautiful state. At least it was for me. Now I know that a lot of us are individuals and we were created individually. And a lot of people have had out of body experiences and a lot of those out of body experiences of course don't go in harmony with what I experienced. However, I still maintain that death is nothing to fear. Death and life are one. It's nothing to fear. So with that being said, that's all that I'm able to give right now on this subject. And um, I thank everyone for listening because it was a um, it was a harsh experience, but it was a beautiful experience all at the same time. Would I go through it again? Yeah, I would. You know, I no longer ride motorcycles anymore, but I wouldn't change a thing because I learned a lot and I'm still learning a lot about the experience because things are consistently coming to me. So this is one of the reasons why it took me so long to um, share what I've learned because I was given bits and pieces of understanding along the way. And so I said, well, the creator will inspire me in time or when it feels as though I'm ready to tell the world. So with that being said, I thank you for listening and I hope someone got something out of this. And I'm glad that I finally made this video so that I can get past this. And with that being said, everyone have a beautiful evening and everyone stay human. Peace.